can we make it quick? Hi everyone, my name is Warner Isaac Gary from Gary Science Lab, and today is going to be sort of the prologue to quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics itself is very interesting, and we've done an entire series on it. But at some point, you have to ask, where did it come from? Why was it discovered? So, let me take you back to 1670. Sir Isaac Newton had already finished in 1665 his theory of all regular matter. And since a limited understanding of chemistry at the time told us, didn't tell us about subatomic particles or photons or bosons or any of the other funky stuff, the only other thing left for him to study was light. He had already studied solids, liquids, and gases. The only thing left was the thing that didn't seem to be made of ordinary matter, light. Now, what did he determine? Well, from his experiments, which he documented in his book called Optics, which included reflection and refraction, he determined that light was made of tiny bodies called corpuscles. Where coles is the part that means small, and corpus is just the word for body in Latin. It was basically just saying it's made of particles, small bodies. So, according to Isaac Newton, this is what was called the corpuscular theory. These small balls would be repulsed from some surfaces, but not others. And reflectivity, which is what we call it in the modern day, was for him the repulsiveness of a material. Glass was especially repulsive to these little corpuscles, while other materials were not, and so the corpuscles stuck. Refraction seems a little bit trickier to explain. That's not refraction. But what he said is that some materials, just like the repulsive glass, are also attractive. That is, their interface exerts a force on the corpuscles that causes them to change direction. Both of these theories would seem absurd in the modern day, mostly because this doesn't account for two very glaring edge cases. Number one, what happens if, you know, two light rays hit each other? I don't think Sir Isaac Newton thought that one through. But then again, with the experimental equipment of the 1600s, it was pretty hard to ascertain that the two light beams were close enough for them to actually hit. And by the way, this also did not explain how light managed to come in different colors. So as you can see here, there was a hint here. So why don't they change trajectories? I know, asterisk either. And second, diffraction. Well, diffraction wasn't really tested by Sir Isaac Newton. We weren't aware of the behavior of waves at that point. So, um, is there an array? Oh. Here we go. That's theory number one, the corpuscular theory. The theory that the corpuscular theory. The theory that all light was made of these tiny particles that were attracted and reflected from certain surfaces. Oh, and the third thing that he didn't seem to notice was that glass can reflect and refract the same ray of light by splitting it into two different beams. How could it be both attractive and repulsive at the same time? I don't know, ask Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, it should be out of here. So then, all of this could be explained 
by Thomas Young. In 1799, so that means about a century after Sir Isaac Newton did his work, he conducted Young's interference experiment. What he did was he took a wall with two holes. With water flowing through it. Not really flowing, it was a stagnant body of water. And of course, at the end of the pool of water was a wall to keep everything contained. Now, what he did was he created a pulse within the water. By exerting a force, he created a circular wave. And he watched as that wave performed diffraction. Small bits of the wave emerged from each of the holes and started interfering with one another. And the interference pattern that resulted was strong amounts of force and energy in some fringes and weak amounts of force, low amounts of energy in others. There was a repeated pattern that became strongest around the center. Young graphed the intensity of the water waves over this entire wall, and it ended up looking something like this. So, as you can see, these are places of destructive interference, where the waves emerging from the two holes destructed each other, destructed each other, and these are places of constructive interference, where they added to one another. Constructive, destructive, and of course, the highest fringe is the most constructive. Then, he performed the same exact experiment, but instead of making pulses with water, he used a light source. He took his light source and projected it onto a wall. that also had two slits. And on the back, he recorded the interference patterns that were formed. Just the same way, he got small light fringe, dark fringe, bigger light fringe, dark fringe, even bigger light fringe, dark fringe, the biggest light fringe, dark, and a repeated pattern. So, as you can see here as well, light acts exactly like water. And so, Young conjectured, light is a wave. That explains why it can't collide with itself. And it also sort of explains how in different mediums it changes direction. The wave theory of light persisted for a very, very long time through the entirety of the 19th century. And with the Maxwell equation supporting it, it looked like the wave theory was set for life until the ultraviolet catastrophe. So the Raleigh Jeans Law, you might recognize the name Raleigh from Raleigh scattering. Is a law that talks about the radiance per 
weight so the radiance per unit wavelength of a black body also known as spectral radiance now this which was a function of wavelength and time sorry wavelength and temperature was essentially written as a constant c multiplied by the temperature t over lambda to the four huh So, this law, so this law was totally fine when you're dealing with a high wavelength, as with visible light and infrared. But, ultraviolet was where it started to show a problem. See, the current observations of spectral radiance showed a graph a little bit like this. A little bit like this. And yet, what the Raleigh gene law was telling us was that, oh, oops, I squished a little too hard. It would just keep going up. And since that is not just lambda, it's lambda to the 4, this rapidly outgrew the measurements. By the time you hit the ultraviolet range, the Raleigh genes law was unusable, totally unreliable. So for the ultraviolet range, this doesn't work. So what does? Where's the problem? Now, people were struggling for years to actually explain this. What do we do? This was the problem of the ultraviolet catastrophe. This was resolved when in 1900, once again, 100 years after Thomas Young proposed The wave theory, Max Planck made a crazy assumption. What if somehow light acts kind of like a particle in that its energy is quantized? It has to be delivered in packets. There's no continuous spectrum of energy. It's a staircase. And what was the height of the steps on said staircase? Well, that height was H, which was aptly named Planck's constant, multiplied by F, the frequency of the light. That is, the smallest energy packet, E quanta, had to be HF. That is one of the most important equations in scientific history. And with that, the combination of that in statistical mechanics gave us the adjusted law B e lambda of T is equal to C p over e to the uh, sorry lambda to the five e to the lambda minus one now here's the critical thing to observe e to the x looks like this looks like this, which means that just x plus 1. And of course, if you approximate e to lambda is lambda plus 1 here, you get, oh, this was supposed to go on the top. I'm really doing it. 
you get CT lambda plus 1 minus 1 over lambda to the 5. This just reduces to the Rowling gene law, which shows you that, well, x plus 1 is a good approximation when x is much less than 1. But when lambda approaches those values, things start being called into question. And they can only be resolved using, using a clever combination of statistical mechanics and E equals HF. Now with that, where were we taken? Well, people were shocked by this groundbreaking idea. Light, which is a wave, can suddenly act like a particle. And so, what if particles could take on the properties of a wave? And that was when the wave function the subject of our first lecture on quantum mechanics, and with it, quantum mechanics itself was born. That's it for today. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you in the next one.